Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. I want to thank Chantal and Jack for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm Michael Plyman. I'm a cardiologist from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I came into Jack's world probably about 2017. Um, my backstory is I'm a traditionally trained cardiologist who went down the integrative functional medicine route, then the quantum route, and then doing my own thing as of uh, August last year when I started my own practice. But I got into the biohacking scene in 2017 when my wife came over here, decided she really wanted to go to see the happiest people in the world who live in Bhutan. Bhutan is about the size of Indiana. It's sandwiched between China and India. And it's about a 14 hour flight from St. Louis. And so we were trying to figure out, at least I was, uh, how do I not die from the jet lag flying 14 hours over there? So I started doing some research about you know, jet lag, mitigation, and found some articles about blue blocking glasses. I did not know the science at that time. So I bought the ugly pairs of glasses. I had to like wrap around red ones. I literally looked like a Unabomber on the plane. I had a hood on, and I have no idea how they didn't kick me off the plane, but we made it to you know, Thailand, Bhutan. Also at that point, I did not understand earthing or grounding. I heard that was a good thing to do. So I went outside, shoes off, and standing on the grass. I'm like, is this enough, is this enough? And we're like, sure. So then we went out to Thailand, looking at all the beautiful uh, you know, artwork and uh, museums and such. And the jet lag was present, but it was probably about, my estimation, about one third what it was previously flying uh, that far east. So like, there must be something to all this light stuff. I'll read about it when I get back. So I just started to dabble with it a little bit. Then they end up with uh, some of my friends. They rent a place in Italy every summer and we're hanging around, drinking wine, telling great stories. And we meet a wonderful guy named Yano. Yano's like, you're a biohacker? I'm like, I don't know. I, I found that term, I, I think I'm a biohacker. He was like the biohacker supreme at that point to me. He knew everything about light. I was like, how do you know all this stuff? He's like, there's this guy named Jack Cruz. You know, he's really helped me with my, you know, he had this medical condition, he had multiple sclerosis and was not doing really well for a while. And Jack helped him get a lot more optimal. So he's like, you need to start reading Jack Cruz's stuff. I'm like, all right, I'll start reading Jack Cruz's stuff. So I went really deep down the rabbit hole of live water magnetism for the past three years. So as I said earlier, I was traditionally trained in cardiology, three years of uh, training after you do three years of internal medicine. And I really thought I was gonna be a, like a stent jockey. I was gonna like open up arteries, you know, save heart attack victims. And people still need to be able to do that. But by the end of my third year, I was like, there's something to the prevention aspect of this that's really intriguing to me. You know, why do these people keep coming back? Why do they keep coming back? And you know, financially, it's, you know, it's like an annuity if they keep coming back, but it wasn't satisfying to keep seeing the same people coming back and back. So I really started reading more about, you know, at that point it was called functional medicine. You know, it was mostly down the, the paradigm of nutrition and exercise. I think that's almost where everybody starts with a, you know, on this journey. And it, you could see some people getting better, but you knew that there was always still something more. And fortunately, I fell into this biohacking scene and fell into Jack's world. So I uh, did essentially you know, uh, seven years of traditional cardiology, but I was still doing this integrative functional medicine stuff under the umbrella of you know, a hospital-owned group and then a private practice. And I was always the sort of the pariah person, you know, like, oh, that's crazy Dr. Dryman talking about nutrition. Or, oh, now he's wearing the blue blocking glasses in the office and in the hospital. And I was like, I don't care. The science is pretty strong. I'm sleeping awesome. I feel great. I don't care what these glasses look like. I'm going to keep doing it. So I've been wearing the glasses consistently inside since 2017. I basically tell my patients that if you come to my office within six months or a year and you're not wearing the glasses, you're probably not my patient anymore. Um, so, you know, eventually I got to the point where I was like, I gotta like either decide I'm gonna do my own thing or I'm gonna stay in this hospital system and keep taking care of Humpty Dumpty's essentially. People who don't really wanna get to the root cause of their problems, they break, the doctors put them back together, they go back out in the world. And you're always gonna need doctors to put you back together when you're completely broken, but I really wanted to get to more of the root cause. So in August of 2019, almost one year ago to the date, I launched my own solo cardiology practice called Apollo Cardiology. Apollo is the sun god, he's also the father of Asclepius, who's the god of medicine. So I was like, that's an appropriate name for my medical practice. And also from old school uh, marketing, you know, you wanna have something with A, so if you have the yellow pages, they would find you first. So. I named it Apollo Cardiology, and we've been busy about 11 months. I have one team member, Cassidy, who's awesome. She's holding down the floor while we're down here today. Um, but that's a little bit about my story. You know, I'm gonna talk today a little bit about you know how you can really find out are you at risk of a heart attack or stroke because that's my passion is finding people who don't end up with my colleagues. 
Um, and there's three major tests that I typically recommend all patients consider who don't want to end up in the hospital. So even if you've had heart disease before, there's still stuff you can do that prevents you from having a second event. But if you're younger and don't ever want to have one, um, you need to find somebody like myself or somebody who understands the jack world of light water magnetism. So many of you here know, you know, you've had your blood pressure check, you've had your cholesterol check, probably your blood sugar, you know if you smoke, you know if you're overweight. Those are kind of the five big things that cause many of the issues with heart disease. But there's probably about 395 other things that can cause heart disease. And unless you go looking, you don't always find them. And it's always it was a mystery to me why you would just treat somebody based off labs and numbers when you never actually look to see do they have disease in their arteries in the first place. And I guess I'm an invasive cardiologist. I've done thousands of heart casts and go look up in your arteries. But even that, you're only looking at the flow of the blood through the artery. You're not looking at the health of the wall. So essentially, you know, how a heart attack happens, it's not that your arteries are a sewer pipe filling up full of sludge and now it's 100% blocked and there's your heart attack. It's that the artery wall gets diseased many years before you have the event. And by the time you start having symptoms when you're exercising, chest pain, shortness of breath, exercise intolerance, you're pretty late to the game. You probably have a 70% blockage in one of the three major coronary arteries. So stress tests are good if you're having symptoms, but stress tests are not sufficient to tell you do you have disease or not. If you fail a stress test, you have a lot of disease. If you don't fail a stress test, you have no idea how healthy your arteries are. And this happens too frequently in the world. This is an older story, but you know, Tim Russer, NBC News announcer, he passed his stress test about two, three months before he dropped dead at NBC News. What they don't ever tell you is that he actually had a fairly high risk CT coronary calcium score. And I've been doing that test for six, seven years now. And so that's my like number one go-to test to tell you, are you low risk or high risk of a heart attack? It's called a CT coronary calcium score. It's about $100 at any type of imaging facility in the US. Most of the time you need a doctor's order because it involves ionizing radiation. Some centers are set up to have a doctor kind of automatically order for you. But this test, very low dose of radiation, CT scan, takes about five minutes, you hold your breath for about 10 seconds, in and out of the scanner. And this test looks at, do you have calcium in the walls of your arteries? If there's calcium in the walls of your arteries, that indicates that plaque is building up in these arteries. You have hard plaque that's somewhat older, and you have soft plaque. They always kind of go together. It's very uncommon that you'd have a low risk calcium score test and still have a lot of plaque. Can happen, but not very often. So most of the time, six out of 10 people over the age of 40 are gonna have an abnormal CT coronary calcium scan. Their score will be greater than zero. I've seen people in scores, you know, have zero and they're 85 years old. They've been doing something right. They should keep doing what they're doing. But I've also seen the highest score I've ever seen in a 48 year old man. I'll tell you his score in just a moment. But zero is a normal score. If you have a calcium score of zero, your risk of a heart attack is approximately 0.6% over five years. It's about the best policy you're gonna ever have that your low risk and what you're doing is working for you. Yeah, between 100 and 400, you're high risk. Over 1,000, you're very high risk. If you're over 1,000, you very likely have one, if not all three of your arteries having severe disease. And it does not necessarily mean you need stents or bypass, but you need to do a whole lot more so you don't go end up having a heart attack or stroke. The highest score I've ever seen was well into the 5,000s. He was a 48-year-old man. Um, I ended up doing a heart catheterization on him. He had severe left main stenosis. He actually had an aneurysm that was about eight millimeters coming off his left main. It was unstintable. My friend really wanted to try to figure out a way to fix it without sending the bypass, but unfortunately I had to send a 48-year-old guy to triple bypass. Fortunately, he did well, and very likely for him going to do that calcium score test, probably ended up saving his life. So calcium score test is indicated for pretty much anybody over the age of 40 who has more than one risk factor. If you've already had a heart attack, stents, bypass, the calcium score test really isn't gonna add more information to you. If you're already high risk, you need to be treated like you're high risk. The second test I recommend patients get is called a C, that's actually called a carotid intimal medial thickness scan, or CIMT. It's an ultrasound of the neck artery. Um, I brought a lot of my toys from the office. I can essentially uh, do 99% of what a cardiology office can do with the little gadgets I brought with me today. I have a portable ultrasound machine with me today, so if anybody wants me to scan their neck or their heart, I'll take a quick look for you. But the CIMT is an ultrasound of your neck artery. It's not looking at just the flow, that's the carotid 
duplex. By the time you have an abnormal product duplex, you know, somebody puts a stethoscope on your neck and here's a bad blockage near a brewery or a flow, um, probably got 50, 70 percent blockage in the carotid artery, kind of late to the game. But the CIMT is actually measuring the intima, the thickness of the wall of the artery. Your intima is going to get damaged earlier than you really start developing a lot of plaque in your arteries. So the neck artery is a pretty good circuit for what's going on in your heart artery. The CMT, painless, 10 minute ultrasound to your neck artery, and they give you a thickness. They'll look at your age, and there's a graph of other people of your age, and they'll give you a percentile. So since if you're a 45 year old man and your arteries are 65 years old, that's a problem. You like your arteries to be your biologic age or younger. Um, I believe it was, uh, I think it was Osler, he stole from somebody else, but basically that a man is as old as his arteries are. So you can look perfectly healthy on the outside, but if you're trash on the inside, uh, you're as old as that person is. So if your vascular age is much older than your biologic age, you want to do something about it. And it's, you know, the baseline is, you know, the light water magnetism stuff. Yes, ma'am. It's based off of like, uh, your artery should be less than half a millimeter thick, and if it's like 0.8 millimeters thick, that's what an 80 year old's artery should be. So they just assume that, you know, that's what your biological versus vascular age is. So it's a standardized graph, essentially. But the real thing, nice thing about the CIMT is that it's not fixed. So you get one of these scans at baseline, you implement whatever changes you're doing. Yeah, ideally, I'll talk about some of those things. You know, you're getting outside, you're getting the proper sun. You know, I got some of the photobiomodulation devices. All these things may help and then six months, 12 months down the road, repeat this scan, and if things are going according to plan, you'll see the plaque shrinking down. And the plaque shrinks down in your carotid, it's very likely shrinking down in your heart. The CT coronary calcium score test, for the most part, it's not necessarily 100% fixed, but once you have a certain score, it rarely goes down. I've actually had a few patients, you know, if they've had scores under 100, I've been able to get them back to zero. That's not that common. It's just that you don't want them to keep progressing. But the CMT is painless, takes 15 minutes or so. So those are the two kind of tests to look at. Do you actually have plaque in your arteries to begin with? But the third test, and I'm the only person in St. Louis doing this right now, there's a test that actually tests your endothelial function. And this is kind of the jack world of nitric oxide. So your endothelium is the inner lining of your blood vessels. It's one cell thick, and if you lay down all your endothelium in your blood vessels, it's about the surface area of six tennis courts. Your endothelium is one of your largest organs. And it's like an air traffic controller. It controls what's flowing in the, uh, the bloodstream and what can get into the walls of the artery. So if your endothelium is getting damaged, it's, I don't like to use the word leaky gut, but it's similar to leaky gut, it's leaky arteries. So your endothelium is not letting things through that are supposed to, and it's letting things get through there that aren't supposed to be there. One of the major things that the endothelium releases is nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a gas that dilates your blood vessels. What I like to tell patients, it acts basically like Teflon. It prevents the arteries from having these other things stick to the arteries and get stuck below it. You know, cholesterol is not the boogeyman. You know, Mother Nature or God did not put cholesterol in your system to give you heart attacks and strokes. But if you're doing something in your environment that's oxidizing or damaging your cholesterol, and your damaged cholesterol keeps interacting with your endothelium, Ultimately, it's going to get stuck in the walls of your artery and keep building up there until you remove whatever is breaking the endothelium. But the endothelium can get damaged seven years before you're going to put plaque in your arteries. So there are tests that you can do to look at the health of your endothelium right now. So this test is good for two types of populations. People who are, quote, young and healthy and want to know, are they truly doing everything they need to do? Or you've already had an event. You've already had a heart attack, stroke, stents, bypass. You want to know. I'm on the right supplements, medication, lifestyle plan. My arteries can release nitric oxide, yes or no. So in the interim, what I do for patients is there's a couple different companies that make these little test strips. You basically spit on your finger, dip your saliva in it, and the darker it turns, the more nitric oxide your body is making. Uh, but a more sensitive test that I offer, and some centers offer, there's a test called the Endopath. I have the box up here and I can show you guys if you want to come see it in a minute. And Jack and Chantel, if you want to do it tomorrow, you got to do it fasting, and I'll give you guys a, a demo if you want. But the endopad test, it's a 15-minute test. You have these little finger probes on your uh, fingers, just kind of like a pulse ox. They're occlusive, um, and they're basically reading the blood flow in your fingertips. You do five minutes, kind of run in at rest to make sure that the flow in both arms are the same. You 
do five minutes at uh, super physiologic or say uh, super systolic blood pressure. So you essentially pump up the blood pressure cup to cease flow to your one arm for five minutes. You'll get a pins and needle sensation in your hand sometimes. And on the uh, monitor, you can see that the flow in that arm is ceased and you have a test arm that's still kind of looking like a little uh, seismograph. After five minutes, you open up the blood pressure cuff, let the blood flow rush back in, and you get something known as reactive hyperemia. And so as the blood is rushing back into the arm, it's banging into all these small blood vessels. All these blood vessels see this big slug of blood coming back, and they're like, okay, there's a lot of blood coming back. And it hits this sheer stress uh, receptor essentially on the blood vessels, and they start dilating because they're releasing nitric oxide. The more nitric oxide gets released, you'll see the arm basically expanding. And there's a ratio, it should increase by at least 1.68, so 68% increase is quote normal, but it should actually double in size to have optimal uh, endothelial function. So if your endothelial function is over two, whatever you're doing in your lifestyle is working for you, keep doing it. But I've seen people who look healthy and there's, you know, I exercise every day, I'm doing interval training, and their endopat score is one. Whatever you're doing isn't you know, necessarily gonna keep your arteries healthy for a long time. So. Now that I know that UVA light is probably the major thing that boosts your nitric oxide, I'm obviously telling patients, you know, get outside in the sun more, use your D-Minder Pro app to know what time of day is, you know, to optimize your solar talus. So, you know, for people who have never been outside, not you guys, but my newbies, okay, start slow and work your way up. Um, you know, I don't always wear this in my office, but I got the, you know, the UVA changing color beads, tell the patients, you know, get these, you'll know when UVA is outside, uh, and boost up your nitric oxide levels. And in the interim, they can use the test strips. So those are my three kind of major tests to look at, you know, what is your risk of having a heart attack, CT coronary calcium score, CIMT, and then the endopad are using the test strips to know what your nitric oxide levels are. So one thing I want to talk a little bit about today was photobiomodulation. I am not yet an expert, but I would like to work on towards becoming an expert in light therapy for cardiovascular diseases. Um, I do have a laser watch up here that I can let you guys play with if you'd like. Um, you know, it has different uh, you know, red, yellow uh, frequencies that you can program, and it's uh, something that I played around with a little bit for jet lag. I have not yet to use it therapeutically for patients yet, but I just this is the smallest photobiomodulation device I could fit in my carry-on only luggage. So, and my new jack also had all the, the crazy lights down here, so I didn't need to bring the big stuff. But photobiomodulation has been used for cardiovascular disease for a long time. Photobiomodulation, modulation or just how you use light therapy to interact with your biology has been around since at least 1967 when they essentially accidentally discovered that red light grew hair. Um, I can't remember the gentleman's name was up in the head, but he was from Hungary. Um, he was trying to uh, see if uh, light therapy would actually induce cancers in mice. Uh, he had cut them open and he was shining red light on them. Uh, the wounds healed better and hair grew better on the, the animals. I was like, that's interesting. So then they kind of went down the rabbit hole of, you know, how does red light do this? Um, it's mostly that the red light, for the most part, is stimulating uh, the cytochrome C oxidase, and you're making more ATP. Um, but it's also, you know, through Gerald Pollock's work, it's very likely increasing the exclusion zone in the water that's surrounding your mitochondria. So you're charging up the batteries of your cells with the red light. Because of the Cold War, a lot of this research was kind of buried in uh, Russia for the most part, and some of Germany, um, and the Americans really didn't listen to it for a long time. Uh, they actually started developing uh, intravenous red light devices in the, uh, the mid 80s or so, uh, and because they did not have the same pharmaceuticals and stints and such over in Russia, they're using a lot more light therapy to treat cardiovascular diseases. Um, some I'm very interested in, I want to try to learn as much as I can about it so I can start trying to implement more of this into my current practice, but this is not ready for prime time, and if you go to a general cardiologist, they're going to have no idea what you're talking about. But this is stuff you can do on your own that you don't need your cardiologist's permission to do for the most part. Yeah, getting out in the sun, getting your chest exposed is free. Getting a red light box is going to cost you three to four hundred bucks. Yeah, if you want to start doing, yeah, I'm not saying people should do IV red laser. Um, I have a friend in St. Louis who does have one of these devices. It's very excellent for patients with cancers and autoimmune conditions. Um, and currently I do have one cardiac patient going to her. He has a severe cardiomyopathy, ejection fractions in the low teens. He's on all standard of care medications. He's on all the mitochondrial supplements you can possibly think of. Uh, he has a 5 ICD, so he has a fancy 
$50,000 device in his heart that regulates his heartbeats and tries to synchronize when the left side and the right side squeezes. He was still getting short of breath walking across his room. I told him, your best option is to try this IV laser before you go consider getting a particular assist device or getting on the transplant list because this guy's in his mid 50s. So I think he's had about 12 sessions of IV red laser. You can also do UV laser. You know, it's anecdotal at this point, but he is feeling a little bit better. He did have to go to the hospital recently, get diuresis a little bit, but he's at least holding off the timing of going to go consider getting a transplant. I just talked to him this week. He still doesn't want to go for the transplant of Al. He wants to give it a few more shots of, you know, three times a week red laser. Uh, my friend's treating him with uh, IV and topical red laser. So the way you think of it is that, you know, the topical red laser or the IV, you're directly stimulating the mitochondria in the heart. The heart by weight is approximately one third by weight mitochondria. Something I was never taught in any of my cardiology training, but now it makes all the sense in the world that if the mitochondria aren't making the energy that they need, you have a brown out of energy in your heart, and that's what's causing a cardiomyopathy or weak heart. There's essentially two kinds of heart failure. Uh, one is diastolic heart failure, where the heart can't relax very well. And then there's systolic heart failure, where the heart doesn't pump very well. You know, most people understand that you know, when the heart doesn't pump very well, I could slap my little probe on you right now and tell you, do you have a strong heart, yes or no? But the one that's actually more interesting and actually much harder to treat is the diastolic dysfunction, where the heart is relaxing. And the heart relaxing actually takes a lot more energy than the heart squeezing does. So diastolic dysfunction is actually becoming more common for a cause of heart failure than the systolic or the pump not squeezing. But they're both mitochondrial dysfunction issues. But not necessarily treated the same clinically with you know, medications, but anything that would stimulate the mitochondria should help both of those conditions. And so either if you have heart disease, you can do this stuff, or you just you know, are a biohacker and you don't ever want to have heart disease, get the baseline test, see where you're at, and then use photobiomodulation as needed. Now, if you want to you know, go deep down the rabbit hole, you know, I do have a, a clinical practice in St. Louis, Apollo Cardiology. You know, I will uh, stay up here and answer you know, any questions you guys do have about this. I do thank you for your attention today and wanted to keep it a little bit short so that the other speakers have time to speak. Um, but I do uh, want to uh, let you know I'm mostly active on Instagram just because that's where some of my audience is for the biohacking scene. I'm Dr. Twyman, Dr. Twyman on Instagram. Currently I'm doing a 24-hour uh, glucose monitor challenge for myself just to see how uh, nutrition and exercise mainly affect my glucose. But I'd like to talk to Jack later to see uh, I would try to design a little protocol to see, like, I'm actually a little bit scared to do it because um, I've not pretty much ever taken off blue black glasses when I've been inside for three years now, but I want to see exactly what kind of protocol I should do to see what would raise my blood sugar, how much blue light is it going to take. So i got to figure out, like, what blue light diet I need to do to see how much it's going to jack up my blood sugar. So um, if you want to see me doing this, uh, follow me on Instagram, but otherwise, ApolloCardiology.com or drtwyman.com. That's the main ways to find me online. So um, I do thank you guys for your attention and I'll open up to any questions you have.